to worry about the visuals, I toss them out. I only keep the audio of the recordings. Um, I'll also start sharing my screen. And, uh, and if, if you are able to turn your cameras on, that's really nice. There's a couple of reasons. One is it's nice for me to see your faces, and, um, but I understand some people don't have cameras at work or might have people around them. But if you can turn on your cameras, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna ask for some people to help me with uh, reading. Uh, today because we have a lot of poetry and I don't want to read it all. I'd love to have some readers. So I'll just call on people. Uh, all right. So um, it's interesting. Here we are. We're like uh, at the beginning of the 20th uh, century here. So we've covered roughly 100 years since we began the, the, the course. And this is week nine, I think. So we're just about on, on target, right? Um, especially since uh, this is arguable, but um, I, I almost think that in terms of the, the, the kind of co competition between America and um, the UK in terms of uh, writing in, in, uh, in non-colonial -col writing in, in, in English, I would say that the 19th century is the British century and it's possible that the 20th century, maybe the American century. It's, so you have to see what happens to the 21st century. So um, uh, it makes a lot of sense that we took a little bit longer with the 19th century, but here we are um, at the, uh, at the um, beginning of the, the, the 20th. This word here, fin, uh, fin, or this phrase, fin de siècle, means end, end of the century. So that's basically all it means. So, um, so it's something tends to happen around the ends of centuries where kind of amazing work sometimes gets produced. And, um, and in any case, it's a very interesting century because the 20th century kind of came in with a lot of intense, uh, intense political and social upheaval. And the novelists and the poets and um, the painters and the and the, and even the filmmakers, the beginning film, you know, film was just starting to catch up. Were uh, were on top of this, and they were really charting and and helping to propel this really intense century. Ed, King uh, King Edward takes the throne in I think 1901, and he only holds it until 1910. But we usually tend to call this the uh, Edwardian period. Um, so. Uh, so, so that's where that's where that comes from, the Edwardian period. I give this whole sort of period that I'm talking to, which I will call the kind of beginning of modernism and the end of the Victorian period. So, the sort of I think that's another way to understand this. I probably should have uh, uh, written it this way, but sort of we can think of this as sort of the you know uh, beginning of modernism. Um, and then you have this very interesting. Uh, quote, which a lot of people pay attention to by Virginia Woolf. And what she says is that on or about December uh, 1910, I love that she tr uh, puts that in a specific date. And I've looked at, you know, what, why people think this is. Some of it has to do with personal things for her, but um, it, and this is in a, I'm blanking on the name of the uh, short text this is taken from, something about Mr. and Mrs. Brown, but I'm blanking on the whole title. Um, uh, on or about December 10, uh, 1910, human nature changed. All human relations shifted. And when human relations change, there is the same, at the same time, a change in religion, conduct, politics, and literature. And this is a brilliant statement. And it really does show us that this moment, you know, when you have all these very important things happening, um, is, uh, is really, really um, a change that happens not only uh, on the subjective level to us as people, but also on the kind of objective, political, social, cultural level, all this stuff sort of changes at once. And um, I think this is a, a, um, a really helpful um, statement by Virginia Woolf. And we're gonna come back to Virginia Woolf, who was a very, um, really, really brilliant um, thinker about these kinds of things. So um, important moments that sort of 
move us into this thinking. Um, one important move, movement is the Armory Show of 1913. Um, so this is the moment when, um, I mean, this happened in, in, in New York, but it had, it had uh, an incredible um, impact on the whole uh, English speaking world. And that is the um, introduction of um, modernist um, art painting uh, sculpture, et cetera. Um, and so who are the who are the people that got really introduced here that um, they would be people like um, Monet, um, Manet, um, Cezanne, um, did I misspell that? Maybe it's supposed to go like this. Yes. Um, Monet, Manet, Cezanne, um, Picasso, um, uh, uh, et cetera. Okay. So really important show. And um, as we will see that uh, painting changes tremendously, uh, you get several movements all at once. You get at least these movements were happening, like they were happening in Europe. Um, you had like expressionism happening largely in the north of Europe, but you had um, uh, post-impressionism and cubism uh, importantly happening in uh, France and, and Spain, right? Um, and several Spanish artists, including Picasso, who's often taken as a French artist because he lived in Paris, but he's a, a Catalan artist. He's from, uh, from Spain. So um, I think cubism, uh, uh, future, something called futurism, which we won't talk a lot about because it's kind of crazy, but it's just this whole uh, uh, kind of addiction to speed and images of, of whirling and just very, it's supposed to be looking towards the mechanical future, almost like strangely like a postmodern idea already in, in the, in the, um, in the early 20th century and um, uh, post-impressionism. So it's not like, uh, it's not like all of these things, Monet and Manet were painting in 1860, 1870, but it wasn't introduced and made super popular until this moment of the Armory show. And then all the artists who saw it went off and changed what they were doing, right? Um, World War II, World War I, uh, of course, is incredibly impactful insofar as um, uh, um, the largely thought of as the first uh, um, sort of modern uh, war with um, modern, um, uh, with, with really modern, um, mm, what's the word, I'll, I'll just say uh, modern way, uh, forms of um, warfare. So, and, and, you know, by this, of course, what I mean is they used uh, largely chemical weapons in World War I. They used uh, um, bombing of, of civilians. Um, it was just an incredibly violent and war. So, Compared to World War II, it, it didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't the, the the numbers, but for the time, the numbers were outrageous, and it was largely a war fought for political interests. Um, in the background of World War One was um, what was happening in Russia and in Germany, and to a lesser extent in Austria and England, and even in Spain. And that is that there were there was a socialist movement happening that. Um, begins, you could say a communist movement, that's fine, I have no problem with that, um, really begins with um, the first revolution happens in 1905 and it's a failed revolution to overthrow the czar in Russia. So all of this, all I'm trying to suggest to you is when we get to these poems, I want you to think about how you have this kind of stable Victorian period, right? And um, it's important to remember this fact, right? In uh, uh, in terms in terms of a stable Victorian uh, period, 
I want you to remember um, that all the way up until um, um, 1910, um, sorry, right up until 1910, um, uh, the UK, um, or, the, or the, let's just call it the British Empire, controlled roughly one third of uh, the population. So they were, it was an incredibly powerful uh, moment for, for England, for the British poetry that we're studying. So it's, it's very, it, it, at this moment, it's sort of the high point, but it's also like, you can just see people could just wrote about that they could just see and feel the end of it, you know, that it was just at its, it was about ready to burst. <clears throat> Most of this, the, the population that's controlled are in the colonies. So Australia, in um, South Africa, in India, which is a very populous uh, um, uh, country, as we know, <clears throat> they were all um, uh, under the, under the, um, the British Empire. All right. So, uh, any questions about the sort of setup that I've given you? I just want to sort of make you or allow you to see uh, what this is like. I think there were more political assassinations in this period than any other place. Uh, two American presidents were, one was assassinated, another was shot. Um, uh, several, um, uh, several dukes and important uh, Political people were shot. In fact, the World War I um, was a, a largely triggered. It's not like the cause of it, but it was triggered by an assassination. <clears throat> so, um, of an Austrian. Um, uh, and that had to do with controlling, you know, this it was a sort of um, controlling what it, we came to know as Yugoslavia, you know. So, um, there was this incredible, incredible tension. So any questions about, about all of this? I had a question. Yes, please. Um, could you give a definition again of post-impressionism? Because I, I think I missed it. No, I never gave it. So um, oh. you didn't miss it. Um, uh, let me first show you, uh, are you able to see the, the um, this, this uh, uh, okay, good. Let me first show you impressionism, okay? you know that you know who these um, artists are and what they did. It's this kind of like amazing, and this, and this is done mostly in the, in, the, in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, so you have um, people uh, like this. I think this is a, a Renoir. It's not a Degas, I don't think. It doesn't look like Degas, who's a post-impressionist. This is a, um, uh, a Pissarro. Um, uh, let's see. Let me do it this way. Let me just do some of the artists because I'm better at being able to talk about certain artists I know well. Monet. Um, let's see some of Monet's water lilies, um, which are sort of famous, right? Um, the idea here was to capture, um, I was looking for his haystacks because I think they're also really useful to look at to see what I mean. Um, Monet's haystacks, uh, these are very famous pictures. You see how they kind of, they, uh, the reason it was called impressionism is, is it's like not really capturing um, the, uh, the, the, the objective reality of the haystacks, but what it feels like to be in that scene, the way the eye sees, the way light plays off objects. You see, it's all about this impression. And if you look, if you're able, these are not good rep reproductions. If you're able to look at the way that they handled the paint, they actually tried to use the paint to, um, to do different things. So, they, so they, they would use a knife to spread the paint, you know? And so it was largely a kind of movement that people thought was very beautiful, right? So this is part of what they were looking at. Um, um, Monet, Pissarro, um, uh, Manet, I do not consider an impressionist, although he's linked up with that group. Um, I consider probably Seurat a, an impressionist. But then, so post-impressionism, um, you, you guys already know what uh, Vincent van Gogh's work looks like, right? Um, uh, 
And if you don't, I'll, I'll just, um, I know you do, but you're probably, um, to look at um, uh, Van Gogh's work, uh, you see what he's done is, is post-impressionism. He's gone be um, kind of underneath this kind of, um, uh, this breaking up of, of reality into not so much what it feels like in a, like an impression, but actually to get at like what it, what it is like inside, like almost like a child's interpretation, right? He also believes in material. So you can't really see this in, in all of his paintings, but if you were to look at a painting like this, can you see how the paint is put on with a knife? Right, so this is po this is one aspect of post impressionism. It's like to get at the materiality of the paint, and in fact, although Van Gogh wasn't a trained artist, um, he could he could do much more representationally correct paintings if he wanted to. Do you see what I'm saying? He's interested in. Um, uh, and and they didn't use these terms impressionism or post impressionism. Um, they came up when when other people gave them these these terms. So that's what that's what post impressionism is. You also have Gauguin, who's considered a post impressionist. Oh, and my favorite is um, Cezanne. Uh, um, and if you look at um, Cezanne's images, uh, you'll see, uh, for example, here. Do you see how what Cezanne is doing is, um, again, look how the paint is applied. You can't see it because it's all pixelated, but it's implied with huge brushes, you know, um, instead of like really small brushes trying to get the detail. Post-impressionism is largely about, um, or, or what came to be called post-impressionism is about starting to let painting be different than just representation. So if you have photography that comes in at one hand and you have um, painting on the other, when photography comes out and you're a painter, you're screwed. Wait a minute, something else can do way better than I could ever do in reproducing something exactly. So instead I have to find something new for painting to do. So I'm gonna make a beautiful object itself, not capture a beautiful object. And then we look at it and we say, oh, that's great. That looks just like that instead. I'm gonna create something completely new out of this. Painting always had this aspect, but when you get to post-impressionism, it really gets this out, uh, um, uh, this. But let me ask you a question about this, anybody, Serenity or anyone. Um, is this a proper perspectival picture? Do you know what I mean by that? Like, like it, took, it took hundreds of years for painters to learn how to do perspective, to imagine a sort, sort of vanishing point and, and create a kind of perspective in the painting so, so that things looked properly. Does this look properly perspective or not? I think it does for the most part, but in some areas it looks like things are slanted awkwardly. That's exactly right. And that's exactly on purpose. That's a good answer, Abigail. It's exactly on purpose. And what it does, when they showed up at the Armory show and they showed these, um, uh, these Cezannes, you could already tell the direction that Cezanne was going and why Cezanne was such an important crossover artist to Cubism. Because then when you get to Cubism, the, 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 the picture plane is flattened completely. There's no perspective anymore everything is pulled to the surface. Do you see how this is? The perspective is all screwed up now, right? Actually, I don't know whose work that is. That's strange. I mostly, I'm, I, I admit to mostly knowing only Picasso and um, um, Brock. Um, and then it, when they were painting, it's almost impossible to tell the difference between uh, the two of them, but you can see how they're breaking up everything, fracturing everything and pulling it to the surface of the painting. So that's what so that's what got these artists so excited. Okay, so that's about as much as I have as an art historian. You just got it all. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> uh, but I really think it's pretty amazing to watch the transition from impressionism to post-impressionism to cubism. And then if you want to go all the way, which we're not going to do today, you can look at abstract expressionism, right? Uh, works by people like de Kooning, uh, Franz Klein, um, 
those 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 folks um of course uh pollock and uh, you know where you're just dripping paint on the canvas or you're just like using big house brushes to paint your canvas or even what became known as color field paintings like Rothko, where it's just like vibrating colors is all you're looking at. Okay, any questions about this? There's a corresponding move in poetry and the novel, and we'll get to this when we get to talking more about um, modernism proper. So in other words, realist fiction begins to break away and poetry begins to become more experimental in the same ways. So like, just like paint becomes the, the medium that you're using and you're calling attention to the paint rather than to the tree over there, in the same way for a poet begins to, you start to pay attention more to the, um, what, what uh, um, Ezra Pound calls the image. Not the, not, the, not the tree itself, but the image, right? And the image that captures that tree calls attention to language itself. Language becomes like paint, something you can call attention to on its own. And again, this has always been part of painting, but it just becomes a bigger part as things move forward. Okay, so the two poets we're gonna look at today, um, both, um, the reason I like these poets is they both sort of, uh, you could say that they both uh, could be considered Victorian and modernist. They have like almost two periods or two kinds of ways of, of doing their um, poetry. Uh, Thomas Hardy, um, the viewless wings of poesy is a line from Keats, which I borrowed here. Um, it's from his ode um, on a nightingale. And he, um, uh, in a poem we're going to look at today called um, Darkling Thrush, I really feel like what he's doing at this moment is um, saying to Keats, there's no hope. <laughs> so like basically it's very dark, right? It's like, there's no hope. Um, I don't see any reason for hope. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> when he got to the novel we're about to read next, for next week, um, Jude the Obscure, which was something like his eighth or ninth novel, he just gave up writing novels altogether and just started writing poetry. And we'll talk more about this when you look at the, the novel Jude the Obscure. It was considered quite um, controversial because it was, um, it, it, it seemed to um, talk about religious hypocrisy class warfare between poor people and people, you know, and, and the way in which poor people are not allowed up and, in, and, 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 and um, immoral in its depictions of relations between men and women. So it was like, he had had enough <laughs> when the critics just said, and to me, it's his best novel. When the critics said, this is trash. He was just like, fine, I'll write poetry. <laughs> he was already like 60 and rich, you know I mean? Like, and he came from kind of like working class background. So he was like, this is fine. I have enough, you know? And people loved his poetry too. It wasn't like they stopped reading him. Um, but uh, when he wrote his early novels like Tessa, the Dubervilles, or, um, or even Return of the Native, people thought, oh, he's great. You know, he's the novel of whatever, novelist of whatever, but when he wrote Jude the Obscure, they said, okay, he's gone too far. Okay, so that's him. Um, the and, and, and let's look at him now, and then we'll come back to, to Yeats in a minute, okay? So let's go ahead and look at um, um, uh, a, um, a couple poems by, um, by um, Hardy, Thomas Hardy. This is the poem I would like to uh, look at first. I'm sorry that it's kind of like broken up. It begins here and then um, continues up here. But you can see they're all, it's written in these four line stanzas, uh, which are called quatrains, if you remember. It's all written in these four line stanzas. Oops, I did not mean to do that. I meant to just do this. Um, four line stanzas, boom, boom, boom. And you can see that it um, was actually first written in 1867 but he never showed it to anybody. He didn't try to publish his poems. Um, he was just working on being a novelist. In fact, he had been um, an architect. 
he had trained as an architect. He was a good drawer and um, his father had been a house builder. So he knew about the building trades. And um, that's why the, in his novels, um, Jude the Obscure, um, Jude is um, also like this. So the poem I wanna look at written again in 18, um, is it 1867? Yes, 1867, but you can see not published until 1898. When you see these dates at the end of poems, that means um, this over here is when it's published and this over here is usually when it's written if they know. This is, um, they're not always there, but they, if, if you see them there, that's what they mean, okay. So I'll read this one and then maybe I'll ask for help for re reading the next one. Um, I, I, I adore this, this poem, um, but you're gonna see that in some ways it's still a very kind of like dark romantic poem. Um, it might not be that different from the Keats poem we looked at, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, okay? Um, it's very rhythmically even. We stood by a pond that winter day and the sun was white as though chidden of God, and a few leaves laid on, lay on the starving sod. They had fallen from an ash and were gray. Your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago, and some words played between us to and fro, on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive enough to have strength to die. And a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird a wing. Since then, keen lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face and the God cursed sun and a tree and a pond edged with grayish leaves. So um, a breakup poem, right? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> a, a, a poem about a breakup. Um, and, and I think you can see that like, at this moment, he's taking what Keats or Tennyson were doing and um, I think, taking it in, in simply a much more direct psychological and, um, and uh, truthful manner. He's sort of taking romanticism and taking all the prettiness out. There's nothing pretty about Thomas Hardy's writing ever, right? Uh, but the lines like here, you know, the smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive enough to have strength to die. Um, to me, this line really is the kind of line that really sets Hardy apart. And what I'm sort of suggesting is that there is um, a kind of um, um, internal and external image, right? So some of the information that's required to write a line like this um, is, in, is, is in the exterior. You can see with your eyes, like the smile and the face and the mouth. But the rest of it relies on internal imagery, like the smile in your mouth was the deadest thing alive enough to have strength to die. And you sort of see how he's stripping away the prettiness from romantic verse and even from Victorian verse like Tennyson's. Um, nothing is left um, to be, nothing is left to be kind of like appreciated simply on the virtue of its beauty. Remember, if it, remember what aestheticism came from is this um, kind of uh, um, idea that beauty is truth, truth is beauty. And here you get um, a beautiful woman and a beautiful and, and a nature scene and it's mostly dead, right? Um, again, I think that Keats 
touches on this in La Belle Dame Sans Merci, if you remember that one, the one that goes, oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, pale and, and something loitering, palely loitering, um, that poem, I think there's a similar sort of thing. But I, I, um, I want you to look at the, um, the, the grayness, um, the, the, the rhyme scheme again is, is that same um, in memoriam stanza, which was becoming popular by this point, A, B, B, A, right? Um, but even a word like ash, we all know that an ash is just a tree, but using the word brings together this other connotation of something that is burned and is completely gone. Do you see what I mean? He's able to bring in these images, um, starving sod, right? The sod itself is even like the ground itself is, um, is like this. And you've been, you've probably just recently, like maybe last month, taken a walk outside and seen a landscape like this, completely gray in the winter, completely like this, right? Um, okay, any, any questions about this poem? So I'm, I'm saying that this is a Victorian poem um, because of the period it's written in, but it also is a Victorian poem. Mm, it also looks forward to modernism already. I had a question. Okay. So the line that says, like an ominous bird a wing, what is it, what does bird a wing mean exactly? A bird that's uh, flying or just starting to fly okay. mm -hmm. or flying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you see, it's not um, a grin of bitterness. It's like, I, I think it's a bird of, of prey, probably. Um, that's what the ominous means, I think. Maybe not just a bird of prey, it could be like a bird that, that, um, that uh, like a raven that that eats dead things, but in any case, not a not a nightingale. You know, it's not owed to a nightingale we have here, right? This is not like, um, you know, the bird. Like in 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 Wordsworth, he says the birds around me hopped and played their thoughts I could not measure, and uh, you know, and you know, their even their singlest movement seemed a thrill of pleasure. This is not like that. This is not a pleasurable bird. This is a kind of dark uh, thing. And if you look at the, the poems, they're just very dark. And so um, uh, this is the next poem I'd like um, uh, to look at. And I'm wondering if um, I can call on uh, someone who would be willing to read this. Or um, it's, it's not super, super long. Uh, let's see, can I call on, um, how about Aaron? Aaron, would you be willing to read this? Are you there, Aaron? Ah, maybe Aaron took a break from us. How about Trevor? Trevor, will you be willing to read this for us? Trevor, me or the, I know there's another Trevor. Who is the Trevor to you? Uh, Jones. Trevor Jones. Yeah, Trevor Jones. <laughs> Whoever is the first to do it, would you mind reading it for us? Yeah, yeah. Just, okay. I, Trevor isn't a very common name. So like any, any time there's another Trevor, I always get confused. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's a good, it's a lovely name. It's better than David. Um, so uh, um, if there, uh, the, I think the only, uh, this word is coppice. Um, I don't think there's anything else that's, um, that's uh, this word is illimited. So just do your best. I think that mostly those are the only kind of like um, maybe difficult words, okay? All right, let's get let's get it. Um, let's get it on. Let's do it. I leant upon a coppice gate when frost and specter gray, and winter's drags made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled vine stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had shot their household fries. The 
fire oh, fires. fire i'm yes, uh, that's okay that's okay the, you're nervous don't be nervous the land's sharp features seem to be the centuries corpse outlent his crypt the cloudy canopy the winds uh the wind his death lament the ancient pulse of german birth was struck in hard and dry and every spirit upon the earth seemed um, feverless Fervorless. As I, fervorless as yes. I. At once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead in a full, full hearted even song of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, and blast beruffled plume Good. had chosen thus fling to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carol carolings yes. of, of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around that I could think there trembled the, through his happy good night air, some blessed hope whereof he knew and I was unaware. Excellent, very good, Trevor, thank you. Yeah, no yeah. good job. Um, so I think the first thing that comes really clear listening to Trevor read it is just how um, Hardy, and this is true throughout his career, is going to stay with those even beats. He was a musician. He was a, a fiddler um, and, and actually made his living for a period of time. You know, when he was a, when he was a teenager, played with his uncles playing like uh, fiddle in, in southern England and little like parties and so forth. So you get this even meter right i lent upon a coppice great when frost was specter gray he's very very even but i just i want you to notice how different this poem is for example than uh, ode to a nightingale right where um there was this intimate relationship between the poet and the bird right so what i want to sort of suggest is that um in keats um in ode to a nightingale What you get um, is you get, oops, right, right, isn't that right? Oh, well, I'm not sure how I misspelled that. All right, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, in any case, uh, what you get in uh, Ode to a Nightingale is you get, um, you get, uh, um, an intimate um, relation between the bird. Stop it, David. Between the bird and the poet. And the bird song equals poetry. So the poet has this really close relationship with his muse, right? Um, um, and uh, this comes like, uh, this is in a number of poems in the 19th century, including Whitman. Um, Whitman has a poem called Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking, where the bird uh, represents like the poet or, the, or poetry, let me put it that way. The bird's song represents poetry. And here, um, there's no intimate relationship. There's no relationship whatsoever, except the relationship of the um, poet to the landscape and the emptiness there that's there. So, so when he hears the, the bird, right? At once a voice arose among the bleak twi twigs overhead in a full hearted, even song of joy illimited. He hears this happy song and he's like, how can this be? There's no reason for this hope, for this happiness. And one thing to pay attention to is when this poem was written, uh, the reason it says 1900, uh, 1901 is it was written on um, uh, December 1st, 31st, 1900. It was written on the, on the um, verge of a new century. So, so 
So what you get is um, uh, a poem that's looking forth toward the new century where you might expect to find hope and he finds no hope. He doesn't see it. And the very word that um, Keats uses, darkling, is um, used in the title. So this word is actually in Keats's poem. Um, he says, um, darkling, I listen um, for, uh, for I have been half in love with an easeful death. That line, that stanza, which is I think the second to last stanza in Ode to a Nightingale is, um, is right there. Okay. So I want you to get um, a couple things. Again, I want you to get um, that there is an internal and external image. And part of this internal and external image has to do with the tangled bind stems, right? So a bind stem would be like a grape, grapes grow on these kind of bind stems or um, uh, ivy, I think it's sort of like this. And so, um, that's what you have is he's, he's sort of um, looking up at, uh, at like, like bare, bare branches and stems that are sort of between him and the sky. So they're probably a tree or several trees planted close together. And, and he's looking and in front of what he's looking at are, the, are these kind of cross hatches, these bind stems. So there's something obscuring his view. And I think this is part of this internal image that it's just blocked, you know, he can't get at it, right? And to score this guy is such a great word because to score, as you know, means to take a knife and to, to cut, but it also means to keep, keep a score, right? Like um, the score to run. And then the third meaning I think is really useful. It means to set to music. Like I scored that poem means you set it to music. You made a musical score out of it. So he sort of has this triple meaning in this. Um, and lyres of course are what the poets use. So it's a symbol of the poet. So even the lyres like the bird song are broken. The strings are broken. So it's very, very, um, um, poetry um, is connected to this figure of the lyre. Um, and this, this harks back to um, Shelley and Coleridge, poems they've written. So, um, uh, and the reason it's connected is because in, in, in Greece and in the oldest poets would play the lyre when they sang their songs. So that's why it's collected. But here, these, these tangled bind stems are blocking out the image. And it'll be, it'll be clear in a second why I keep talking about an image, okay? So um, I just wanted to show you, so this is Hardy, he's dark. So get, be prepared um, when you read uh, um, uh, Jude, of the, Jude the Obscure that, that, that he's a dark, dark poet, okay? Dark, has a dark vision. Any questions about anything I've said about, about Thomas Hardy? We'll talk a lot more about Hardy in the next uh, couple weeks. And one of the things that we'll talk about is his odd class position, the way he was like Keats, um, didn't go to university. And this puts him in an odd class position compared to all the other poets we've been talking about. Um, can, compared, for example, to Yeats, um, who had, who grew up with an academic father um, and had Latin and Greek and um, so forth. I'm not gonna read this, this poem, but um, this is another example of a later poem Um, 1914, a poem written after the, uh, the, um, 
sinking of the Titanic, which was, a, as you know, from the movie, a major uh, event in the early 20th century. Um, the thing that the, the thing about the Titanic that's important to remember is that it happens um, it happens right at the beginning of the of um, the turmoil of the of the First World War. So all of Europe and all of and 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 the U.S. were about ready to be dragged into a to a war that seemed inevitable. Just like when he talks about the convergence of the twain, he's basically saying that the ship and the iceberg are meant to be together and, and they're just going to, to, to meet. Um, all right, so I'm not gonna read it. It's a great poem, but we don't have time. So it's kind of apocalyptic, I think I would say. All right, so let's talk a little bit more. I'm gonna take a moment and talk a little bit more about what the poetic, ideal was at this moment. So fin de siècle poetry, this fellow here, this is Ezra Pound, um, a young Ezra Pound. Um, why do I talk about Ezra Pound who was um, an American? Why do I talk about him in a British literature class? Um, the reason is because um, he was incredibly influential and he moved, he, he went to Europe on a um, Fulbright scholarship, which is a scholarship where you can study overseas. And when he got to um, England, he stayed. He was a Harvard um, graduate student um, studying classics. Um, and he went to England to study poetry, I guess. and. Um, stayed, he never went back. He, 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 he went, started in England, then he went to France, and Paris, and then he ended up in Italy full-time. By the late 20s, he was living in Italy. All right, so here's my kind of like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I wrote this a few years ago, but it's just a lot of blah, blah, blah. Um, so the end of the 19th century saw British poets experimenting with classical meters and themes don't worry about this, that part, because you don't have to know what classical meters are. They're just longer, like da -da, instead of da-da, 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 or da-da, 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 it's da-da, 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 let's see, it's hexameter, da-da, 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 da-da. It's just a weird meter, right? And it's it doesn't feel very natural for me to even think in these terms. And then these gritty, dramatic monologues, Actually, it's anapestic, so it would be da 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 da. Forget it. No worry about it. Well, these poets are like great. They actually are not like a Victorian poet. You cannot say that Thomas Hardy and Swinburne have very much in common, right? But whereas with the Romantic poets, they all read each other. They were all engaged. The Victorian poets, they're just organized by a period, and they don't have as much in common. So I think the Romantics do and the Modernists do and the Victorians are more kind of uh, um, mishmash. And by the, you know, by the end of the, the century, Victorian poetry, except for Swinburne, except for um, uh, maybe Hardy, they, Tennyson had died, you know, Browning had died. It just was not, the, it, it didn't seem, clear what was gonna come. So this is my argument for Thomas Hardy and Yeats. As I said, they seem to be moving forward, right? They seem to be looking towards modernism. And so what I say is that the rhythms and the themes pointed to modernism, but um, they were not completely modernist poets. It's not until we get really to Eliot's um, that we get to, in our class, that we get to a, a modernist poet. So as I said before, um, modernism doesn't really begin in a way until the, uh, World War I, even though Virginia Woolf said 1910. Um, so the Romantics had um, the French Revolution, which was hopeful. It was a revolution about liberation, about all of this, whereas World War I was just simply a war 
fought for nation's pride, for nationalism, and for uh, control of resources, right? So it was a very different sort of um, um, situation. So Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, I think are two of the architects of the ideas of, of poetic modernism. And um, they both uh, lived in exile for the rest of their lives. Um, Eliot became um, a British citizen. Pound uh, ended up in Italy and kind of went crazy and became a fascist, uh, <laughs> seriously. Um, so we won't go into that, okay. So I wanna basically talk about two um, uh, important documents for modernist poetry, but it's only this first one I'm gonna look at today, okay? So the Eliot one, I don't even care about. Today, I just care about Ezra Pound's um, text, A Retrospect. It's written in 1913, and um, a lot of times people take it as a manifesto for, for imagism. Um, uh, and, and it's still a very important text. Actually, I have my poetry students sometimes read it because I think it's so useful, all right? Um, he was so ahead of his time that over a hundred years later, I think it's still useful. So this is what he says in a retrospect that I think these are the main ideas, all right? And it's gonna remind you probably of Wordsworth's preface to the lyrical ballads. He says, in the spring or early summer of 1912, HD, who it stands for an American poet named uh, Hilda Doolittle who lived in England, um, Richard Arlington and myself um, decided that we were agreed about the three principles following. First, the direct treatment of the thing, whether subjective or objective, Two, to use no, absolutely no word that does not contribute to the presentation. Three, as regarding rhythm, to compose in the sequence of the musical phrase, not in the sequence of the metronome. <clears throat> so this seems very clear, straightforward, but I don't think it is. I think it's quite, It requires some unpacking, let me put it that way. So I think this is why I just kept talking about the image um, bef before, um, when I was saying that there's an internal and an external image, like there is the thing that you see with your eyes and the way that it looks exactly, and you wanna capture that. And then there is what it sparks in you, what associations, what ideas, what feelings. And both of them, according to Pound, should be treated directly. So what does he mean by that? He means, <clears throat> he doesn't mean that you can't use a metaphor because a metaphor could be an image, but he means you should not use anything that dulls the image. Um, so, uh, An example of this that he uses in this text, he says, he quotes a line of poetry from uh, some poor person who wrote, um, who wrote the line, the dim lands of peace, dim lands of peace. And he said, don't write lines like that because it's too abstract it dulls the image, right? It doesn't really tell you anything about um, what it looks like, dim lands of peace. What does that mean? And it doesn't really tell you anything about the internal, at least not directly, it's very indirect, right? So he doesn't like that. And then no, uh, use absolutely no word that does not contribute to the presentation. This is really getting rid of all of that fluff of Victorian poetry. And then in terms of um, rhythm, don't write the way Hardy writes. Although <laughs> it's funny because uh, um, Pound actually really admired Hardy's poetry, but um, don't go to da 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 Don't write like that. Instead, let the, let the musical phrase set the rhythm. 
not the, the metronome, the thing that goes, that you practice your piano on or whatever. Or if you use, you know, GarageBand or Logic or something like that, and you make tunes, you know, not that even a metronome that you can click on there to play against, right? Instead, let the musical phrase direct it. All right, so let's, let's talk for a second about what that might look like. So what I wanna do is um, start with a poem that, that sort of disobeys all these rules. Um, this poem is The Cap and Bells by, um, by Yeats. And um, it's a great poem, but it's very much, I think, still a, a kind of old fashioned Victorian poem. So um, let's see, um, uh, who can I ask to call on? Um, to read this. Um, how about Madison? Madison, would you be willing to read this? Madison Yoder? Hello, Madison. I'm beginning to notice, uh, I'm beginning to notice a pattern. Are you there, Madison? All right. Um, how about Maria Delano? Okay. Hi, Maria. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice to nice to talk with you. So, um, if you, you don't too. mind, could, um, can you can you read this poem for us? Yeah, of course. Okay. The jester walked in the garden. The garden had fallen still. He bade his soul rise upward and stand on her window sill. It rose in a straight blue garment. When owls began to call, they had grown wise tongued by thinking of a quiet and light footfall. But the young queen would not listen. She rose in her pale nightgown. She drew in the heavy casement and pushed the lashes, latches down. He bade his heart go to her when the owls called out no more. In a red and quivering garment, it sang to her through the door. It had grown sweet tongued by dreaming of a flutter of flower like hair, but she took it up her fan from the table and waved it off on the air. I have cap and bells, he pondered. I will send them to her and die. And when the morning whitened, he left them where she went by. She laid them upon her bosom under a cloud of her hair and her red lips sang them a love song till stars grew out of air. She opened her door and her window and the heart and the soul came through. To her right hand came the red one, to her left hand came the blue. They set up a noise like crickets a chattering wise and sweet and her hair was a folded flower and the quiet of love in her feet excellent thank you very much yeah. um so uh so you can see like um with that excellent reading that um, um and thank you Maria, that you get this excellent reading that um uh that basically um has the same rhythms as a romantic poetry. It's definitely written in the, um, in the rhythm of the, mus of the metronome, not in, in the sequence of the musical phrase, right? Um, it, it has an established beat. It's basically um, four, three, four, three, right? Um, so, so it's not doing what Pound wants to do, and that's fine. I mean, look, it's written in 1894 or 1893. Um, the other thing is that, you know, Yeats was like in his 20s when he wrote this, um, a young poet, um, early 20s, I think. Um, and yet it's a really a, a lovely poem. It's a very interesting poem about, it's uh, the relationship of, um, between one's uh, loves and the beloved. It's almost like a troubadour po poem, you know? And the jester in this case, I think is the figure that we're supposed to identify with. And um, in each case, when he um, sent his soul and he sent his, um, his heart, both were re rejected. Um, and it isn't until he sends his cap and bells, in other words, he sends everything that he is to her. 
and dies that she then accepts them. So this is either a really beautiful poem metaphorically about how, how you have to give all of yourself in love, or it's a very, you know, very dark poem about how uh, the only way that you'll ever really be loved is if you die, you know, <laughs> uh, for the beloved, you know, and then, then you will be accepted and become a part of, of her. But I wanted to just show you how kind of old fashioned this is, right? From in 1893, much more kind of poetic, lots of old imagery, like at the beloved in the tower, you know, um, much more old fashioned than, than the Hardy poems we looked at and definitely not what Ezra Pound was calling for. So, um, Let's look at this poem called The Second Coming, written um, 25 years later. By this point, you know, Yeats is probably 50. And has embraced aspects of modernism. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and as your note tells you here, the poem is written um, in the aftermath of World War I and the Russian Re Revolution, which was 18, 1917, um, and uh, on the eve of the Anglo-Irish War. So this was exactly the push for independence. He's Irish. The first, I didn't, I don't know if I said this before. Let me go back up. Um, he's Irish, right? Um, he begins in this romantic and bardic mode. I don't know if you know what this term means, but... Um, a bard um, is a kind of um, traditional uh, um, <clears throat> name for a traditional poet um, who speaks for um, a society or um, culture. Right, so he speaks for, he's speaking for Ireland in this early kind of bardic mode. He, you sort of make yourself big, like Shakespeare is considered the bard, right? Um, and then he ends in this much more modernist mode. So what happens in between? Well, what happens in between is that um, somewhere around 1910, I'm not sure of the dates. Um, maybe, let's say maybe 1910 to 1913, because I'm not sure when. Um, Ezra Pound um, becomes Yeats's secretary. So Yeats has this, you know, this house with a, a kind of, um, and, 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 and Pound comes and, you know, copies over his poems, answers letters for him, all this stuff. And in the meantime, they have lots of discussions about poetry and they both write their poetry. So here is Yeats downstairs um, in his house in Ireland where um, Pound is his um, secretary. And then here is Pound upstairs in the same house. So you have a young man and old man. Right, or older man. It seems hard for me now to call. The man is 50 old, but he is. Um, <laughs> this is my own problem, I guess. Uh, uh, so you have Pound here, um, young modernist. And then you have. Yeats here, old, not say older, traditional, right? So what happens is that between them is this fireplace, right? And anybody that has ever, uh, that's a bad line. Anybody that's ever like had a, um, 
fireplace knows that the fireplace transmits sound uh, from one to the other. So this is partly my imagination, but I know I know this story is true, but I don't know if it's exactly, the, I think it sounds a little um, built up for me, but basically what I wanna to suggest to you is that through this mixing, you know, of these two poets, because it doesn't just run one way, it also runs this way, right? So um, it happens both, they influence one another. Through this mixing, um, uh, Pound, um, Pound's poetry um, gets more um, rhythmic, Right, because Yeats, I'm not kidding. If you hear, hear Yeats read a poem, he reads it like this. He made his poem go up to her. Like this, with this kind of like really, like really rhythmic bum, bum, bum. So he's walking around downstairs doing this really rhythmic poetry and Pound is upstairs, you know, doing this more. You know, it's like, like Yeats is like a chant, I think you would call it. And then, um, uh, and then Yeats's poetry, becomes more modern. So it's a really great story kind of in a way, but really cool the way that they, they influence one another. <clears throat> so let's look at this poem that I wanted to, to, to show you and end on today um, called The Second Coming. Um, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know the 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So, <clears throat> you know, cap and bells, you know, <laughs> I bade my heart go out to her, da 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 and then this. Right? I mean, completely different, a completely different poet working here, I would say. I mean, the, the lyricism is still here. The, the, but, but just notice how different it is, right? Um, how he's composing in the sequence of the musical phrase. It sounds so much more natural and not so da 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 da, right? He breaks that rhythm. And not only that, um, I think he's, he's, he's dealing more directly. Remember direct treatment of the object or the thing he says. So you have the, um, so in this case, the thing, right? And I hope this is clear that um, the thing, the direct object of the thing, you have the subjective object. Or a subjective thing, I guess, would be um, uh, the um, internal images, <clears throat> the fear, the awe, right, of what's happening, right? Whereas the objective thing. is, you know, uh, revolution, 
war, um, apocalypse. Is that what I did? Yes, apocalypse. That's what you have, right? I, that's the way I read it anyway. Questions about this, this poem or? Obviously, there's religious imagery happening here, too. So these, these ideas about poetry, direct treatment of the thing, subjective or objective, use absolutely no phrase that does not, uh, um, what is it, does not, contribute to the presentation, um, and three, compose in the sequence of the musical phrase, not in the sequence of the metronome. That's completely uh, here in this poem to me. Um, so any, any questions about this or any ideas that you wanna put forward? Um, I had a question. Yes, um, Caitlin. I didn't catch it, but um, you said that pound becomes more rhythmic, but what does Yeats become more of? Yeats becomes more modern. Okay. So he, yeah, he moves into these same ideas, Caitlin, that we've been talking about, like, like um, the direct treatment, not these kind of indirect images that lead you astray, but direct, the, the using no extra words just to fill in the, the verse line and then composing in a, a musical phrase. Mm -hmm. Great. I had a question too. Yes, please. So when you were typing on the document, you put that um, Pound was young and then modernist and then Yeats was old and traditional, but then you went and said Yeats was more modern. So is it that he was traditional and then became modern? Or? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so, um, so I wanna suggest that, um, Thomas Hardy is an interesting person. Thomas Hardy doesn't ever change, sort of in a weird way. I've read his biography and it's like, he doesn't really change. He starts off as this kind of dour, um, you know, kind of person and he doesn't change, but Yeats certainly changes. He changes. Um, so, so Thomas Hardy just had the good luck and the good sense to, to be a kind of writer who anticipated modernism. Yeats became a modernist if that you see the difference, right? It's like Yeats really became a modernist and largely through his interactions with Pound and lots of other people. Um, so he just, he just allowed, he was, he started in this one tradition and then became this other thing. Yeah, any other questions? All right, well, um, I guess that'll be it for today. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, I will get your, uh, your midterms all uh, graded and then hopefully get all the papers graded as well. Okay, and see you next week. Good luck with reading Thomas Hardy and I'll see you later. Bye.